Okay, now that we got the throttle body situation sorted out, we need to peel off the entire 1.8 harness because we're gonna have to reuse the 1.6 since we're reusing the ECU. So basically we're just gonna connect everything. Disconnect, I mean. We'll be reusing all the fuel injectors. So luckily they have the same connector. that's factory. Also the 94 to 97s have this solenoid in between the fuel pressure regulator and the vacuum source. The 16 does not have that so we're going to be removing that and this is going to go straight here and then we'll need to cap off that line or we can just leave it honestly. You could take it off if you wanted to but Peel off the 1 6 harness. Down here we've got the temp sender. Whoops, a little brittle. The zip tie way down there. I think we're gonna have to pull the fuel rail out, unfortunately. I'm not even sure what this is, honestly. It's got coolant running through it. put this on the new engine. Oh, uh, clip's broken. Well, this should be okay. Now we also gotta take off our coil pack. So we are gonna need the 1.6 coils. This bolt is already all messed up. I haven't even touched it yet. So this donor 1.8 was actually rebuilt. I think I mentioned that. But obviously uh, other people's hands have been on it. So run into stuff like this. All right, so we also need to swap over our coolant temperature sensor. This is a three quarter, I don't, I think it's probably a 19 millimeter, which I don't have a big enough wrench for. There we go, got a seal ring on there already. Don't need to go crazy there. Now we can swap over our coils. So the thing is, the one six valve cover has a different mounting position than the 1.8, so this doesn't fit. It looks like you maybe could put the old coils on this new mount. It looks like they maybe share the same footprint, but maybe not, actually. These look like they may be a little taller. But anyways, our flying Miata kit came with a bracket they made, so we will take these off. Looks like these are eight millimeters, and we'll swap it onto the new coil, uh, and we'll swap it onto the new bracket. modification we got to do. So the 1.6s and the 1.8s have a different coil order. 
the Miata, all of the 1.8s, I believe, are waste spark systems. So when this coil fires, it fires both the number one and number four plug or vice versa. I don't remember which is which, but they're swapped on the 1.816. So we need to swap the sensor wires between the two. So we'll pop this cover off. Clips on that side, off it comes. Looks like that side either doesn't have one or it's missing, don't know. So the red ones are just constant power. These are the signal ones. Looks like they've got six millimeters. They're actually seven millimeter. Want to snug them up? You break the stud off pretty easy. Now we should be able to use 1/8 spark plug wires with this. So here's the flying Miata bracket. Just go ahead and set it in like that. See how this needs to route. Looks like it'll be okay there. We also need a transfer for this little rubber isolator. If we can get it off. It's kind of looking like we cannot. Those little rubber pieces aren't coming off, so we'll just use the washers around this and we should be okay. Seems like it kind of limits the Hangs up on the cam angle sensor a little bit, but it should be fine. So the plug order should be four, one, two, and three. Plug wire just a little short. Good enough. And we'll want to plug in our coolant temp sensor. The coil harness goes to the car. I'm gonna steal off the old cam angle sensor bolt because the one on your 18 is missing. We'll leave it loose because we'll have to put a timing light on it. So we need to transfer over our 16 oil pressure sender because the 18s all have just dummy pressure switches. This tells us the real pressure. I believe it's a 30 millimeter. Should have grabbed the extension. There we go. Here's our pressure switch that we need to remove. See if we can get away with an adjustable. There we go. I like to throw just a touch of this Permatex Aviation or Indian Head sealer, the non-hardening stuff. Okay, and then this is a step that you won't need to do. 
We're going to need to remove this stud for the oil cooler and replace it with the 1 6 shorter stud. There we go. Here we go. You can see the length difference there. Let's spin this one back on here. Now we've got our oil cooler deleted. All right, so that's all the stuff that you need to do basically when you're swapping from a 1.8 to 1.6 before you put it back in the car. We've got a couple of things that we need to do because I've already stolen parts off this 1.8. We need to swap the slave cylinder over from our 1.6. Um, we also need to swap some bolts and stuff that I stole from the 99. But other than that, we are just about ready to put it back in the car. And yeah. I don't know if I mentioned this already, but right now is the time where if the engine needs any work at all, you want to do it because it's a thousand times easier doing it right now than in the car. So if the last time the timing belt was done is unknown, do that. If it's leaking out of any of the seals, do that. If you need a new clutch, do that. This clutch is new. Like I said, this engine was rebuilt like 10,000 miles ago, so we're just going to slap her in nice and easy. If you do need to replace any of the parts, I do have step-by-step -step everything basically for the BP engine that I did on the 99. It's a BP4W, but it applies to all of them, even the 1.6 even though there's minor differences. So check that out if you need it. I'm gonna swap the rest of the junk we need and we'll get it back in the car. All right, so one more thing we gotta swap off before we drop the car back, or before we drop the engine back in the car. I guess you could do it in the car, but we need to change out the throttle cable bracket because the 1.6s have a different length throttle cable. Flying Miata makes an adapter bracket. That should put it at the right length for the 94 to 97 intake. These are just 10 millimeter bolts. And then we also need to put on our intake manifold support brace. I don't really know how important that is, but we'll throw that back on and then we'll get this up on the hoist and drop it back in the car. You know, we need to pull the coils back off, flip them up, um, so that we get a little bit more clearance, so we'll do that. Uh, I think we're going to drain the chert housing while we can. Got a little plug right here, and then we'll refill it on the car. It's going to be really fun to fish in there. Oh. This is a shifter detent there. All right, now before we slide it in, we need to make sure these little steel motor mount covers are on. They're supposed to clip into these little things here, but they tend to fall out, so we might need to tape it up. I mean, you should replace these if they're cracked or anything, but ours are looking okay. I should mention the 1.6 and 1.8 motor mounts are different. So if you're just getting a donor engine, use whatever's on the donor and you'll be golden. I'm talking about this portion here. Personally, my experience has been that these come out easier than they go in. Gotta do a lot of back and forth. All right, so we're getting hung up on the cam angle sensor a little bit. I think we're just gonna pop it out, uh, make our lives a little easier, so do that. Do 
gives us a bunch more room to play with. We have to make sure we're clear of the uh, AC and power steering. Don't recommend sticking your hand in there. So the passenger side mount has a slot in it. So you have quite a bit of leeway. The driver's side is just a hole. So you want to get into the passenger side first. And then the driver's side should kind of slot in. Pull the slot there. Got to twist that way. So you can see there's quite a bit of, you know, finagling you gotta do. The toughest thing is just getting enough angle to drop it down in there. But once you do have enough angle, you wanna actually start getting it nice and flat or else you're gonna run into the back of the firewall and remove all the things that are, that can hit back there. And then you just gotta slot in the motor mount. So it's just a little bit of back and forth, but nothing too crazy. We can actually just move this out of the way now. And then first thing we're going to want to do is get the PPF on. All right, so we just got to jack the transmission up to level the car out, or to level the engine out. Okay, so we just got to try to work the PPF back over both the differential and the transmission. It's kind of a pain, but just got to do it like that. Do we have a spacer that we gotta realign? close-ish on both of them. All right, so now we can get our transmission bolts back through. Maybe. So we still want to leave those loose. They're just going to help us align everything. We've got one more that is directly behind the jack. Pretty obvious where it goes. And you can see there's witness marks on the PPF. We're gonna wanna line everything back up with that. There is actually a PPF um, adjustment procedure. I've never done it, never had issues. If you just try to match what was on there before, we should be okay, but it might be a good idea to do that. If you run into vibrations or anything like that. And for the differential, we're gonna have to push up on this part to try to get it to go up. May even need a jack, because we're a ways off. So try to start with the back bolt, see if we can get it all the way through. Seems like we lost our spacer, unfortunately. So that's really annoying. go. Now we'll pound our little um, collar or whatever I'm going to call it back into the front bolt. That should help us hold our alignment. Now the annoying part if you use the method I use is you got to hold these nuts back in place until the serrations grab back into the spacer. I have found vice grips the best way. So if we can grab it and kind of, well, we can actually thread it on the bolt to start. All right, so I got the nuts started up top here. Now we'll put in this bolt that has a wide shoulder on it. There's a sleeve inside of the differential that pushes up and indexes into the spacer and the PPF. So when we put it in, it's, actually, no, it doesn't. Oh yeah. So it pushed our sleeve up for us. Now we need to put our other nut on. 
All right, so we just need to grab those upper nuts. I don't think you'll be able to see anything because I can't see anything. And just get enough bite on them that we can run these back in. Once the nut starts to grab, then you don't need the vice grips anymore. So our witness marks are pretty close. We'll snug it up and see where we're sitting. Okay, we'll see how that does. You can also tie up this wire harness. Get our speedo cable in. You do have to index it right. There's a little tab that sticks out and you just gotta line it up with the gear in the transmission. There we go. I'm gonna throw this sensor up and around. I think this is the reverse light. Could be wrong. All right, so we have those two connections to make on the transmission. This sensor here, that we need to still tighten up. And then on this side, we have these spade connectors. Let it slot in. And then also we have this 10 millimeter bolt holding our wire harness to the transmission. So I'm gonna tighten those all up and then we can get our drive shaft in. All right, so before we put our drive shaft in, there are a couple of considerations on the exhaust. When you're switching from the 1.6 to the 1.8, you have to either use the 1.8 header, drill a hole in it, weld the bung in it for the O2 sensor, or switch to the 1.8 mid pipe, which we're gonna do because we have it, and use the O2 sensor hole on the mid pipe. The 1.6 mid pipe doesn't have that O2 sensor hole, it's on the header. Or I think you can get like an aftermarket header or something, but sticking the stock's the easiest. So if you can help it, just get the 1.8 mid pipe, swap that out and your life will be a lot easier. So we're gonna pull the bolts here. These are normally studs, but they broke when we took them out last time. And up there, we're already disconnected from our header or exhaust manifold. So we should just need to undo these bolts, take it out and we'll leave them out until we get our drive shaft back in. So you're gonna to wanna to make sure that your drive shaft yoke that goes in transmission is nice and clean. Slide around in. Okay, then we take our drive shaft flange, bolts and nuts, 14 millimeters. I'm gonna go around, make sure it seats nice and even. All right, so I like to throw a torque wrench on all the PPF bolts, just cause they're kind of important. So, the torque spec 77 to 91 foot pounds, I believe. Just go ahead and make sure they're all at least that tight. All right, let's go grab our mid pipe and get that up and in and see what we gotta do there. All right, so here is our 97 mid pipe or down pipe, or whatever you wanna call it, and cat. We're gonna have to, I have to scrounge up the nuts to reattach the cat to the mid pipe. But the biggest thing is the O2 sensor on the 1.6 and the 1.8 are different. You can see the 1.6 just uses a one wire O2 sensor. The 1.8 uses a four wire with a heater. 
so I guess the one six, they just assume it'll get hot enough from the exhaust gas, but it's close enough to the header. So we have to swap them out. Let's use a seven eight wrench or a two sensor socket if you got one. This one is seized pretty good. That one is on there pretty good. All right, so you want to put some never seize or anti seize. Ideally, this copper stuff is really good for O2 sensors because of the conductivity, and it helps it not get all seized up in there. That's way too much. Hopefully, I didn't just kill the sensor. <laughs> Kind of twist it up and then like that. Probably get a bit easy in the gas cap, but I'm a lot of good at you. The nuts I'm using are 13 millimeter. I don't know if they're stock or not because it's the only 13 millimeter in the car, really. All right, so we got all three of our exhaust manifold to mid pipe nuts, and also one of them got drilled out at one point, so we had to use a, a nut and a bolt. Those are all tightened down. Now we have our bracket that goes from the bow housing to the mid pipe. Yes, yeah, so we've got a, a bolt that goes through like that up top that you can't really see and clamps the tube to the bell housing. So I'm gonna put that in. It is a 12 millimeter, it looks like. Looks like this is a 13 millimeter. I don't know if it's the stock bolt or not because people have monkeyed around with this in the past. Yeah. Got it. Shove it up through there. All right, there we go. That's the worst part. Everything else is pretty much pretty easy to access. We just gotta put our cat back on. All right, now we can put our cat up and in. You wanna make sure the gaskets are on either side. Looks like we're upside down. Hang around to support it for us. And we'll tighten these down to tight enough. All right, now we're just gonna put the rest of our exhaust hanger mounts on. Now we are done with the worst part, which is the exhaust always. See. Last thing that we gotta do down here is fill up our transmission. Definitely don't wanna forget that. Everything else should be good to go. Although I'm sure we're probably gonna have to come back down here for something. All right, so here is our fill plug for the transmission. It's a 14 millimeter square drive, so you gotta use an open end wrench unless you got square sockets, which I don't. It's pretty tight. Now it's in a pretty awkward place, so you gotta use a pump. If you don't have a pump, get one. <laughs> There's not really any other way to do it. I guess maybe if you get one of those flexi bottles that they have now, but you might as well just get a pump. Alright, I'm growing up. A lot of people go get all weird about the fluid they use in these. You're supposed to use GL4, but just using the cheap 7590. It works fine. Should take a little under two quarts. So once it starts flowing out, you're gonna pull that thing and put the plug in. There we go. All right, now we're just gonna tighten the plug back up. It's just pipe thread, so don't need to hang the wall on a wrench. 
All right, now we can get our motor mount nuts back on. So we've got big washer, and then the 14 millimeter nut, and the torque spec on that. It's 42 to 58 foot pounds, I believe. So, you know, tight enough. You don't really need to throw a torque wrench on this, but you can if you want. And we'll do the same on the other side. All right, so we're pretty much done downstairs for now. We need to get everything reconnected back up here. So we'll start with the coils, put that back in place. We can also get our cam angle sensor back in. We haven't turned it or anything, so hopefully it should just slot back into the place. Oh man. Looks like you gotta do some real gymnastics to get up in there. Alright, so we don't have enough room to wiggle the cam angle sensor back in, so we're gonna pop the valve cover off. Hopefully get a little bit more clearance. Also get a little peek into our engine and we're looking really good honestly super clean like you'd expect for a recently rebuilt engine timing belt looks to be in pretty good shape it's also got fancy adjustable pulleys on it not that we're ever going to use those maybe i'll zip it in it's got head studs too look at that Alright, so we do have to clean off the little bit of RTV on the cap surface. Alright, so now we just got to put a thin coating on the face of this cap of RTV. I like using the right stuff. Always had good luck with it. Just real thin. So we also got to put some RTV at the corners of every bridge. Really ought to clean this a little better, but we're not going to because I'm a gangster and I do what I want. Alright, you also ought to replace the valve cover gasket, but we don't have a new one. And you know, gangster life, so just reuse it. So you want to snug the valve cover down slowly, working your way around from the center out. These also don't get much torque at all. Put our bolt back in our cam angle sensor lock down. Lots of fun to get in there. We'll leave our cam angle sensor bolt kind of loose because we're going to have to adjust timing. Put our coil back on. We can go ahead and get our AC compressor on next. So we just got to Way. It's a little bit annoying, honestly, but yeah, hold it up in place and then take one of these long 12 millimeter, 12 millimeter headed bolts, thread it through, and once you get one started, 
the rest aren't so bad. Alright, so the top ones are snugged up, the lower ones are easy to do from the bottom, so we'll do that. One of these did have this bracket on here. And of course I cannot remember which one. Now we can go ahead and put our power steering pump back on. Just slides in like that. You gotta push the long bolt down through the front of the pulley, one of the holes in through the sleeve, and then on the back you got the nut. So we'll just snug this up a little bit. And our shorter bolt here holds the, adjust in, or the adjustment bracket to the engine. Also put that on loosely. Now we can put our belt back on. You should probably replace this. We're reusing it because, again, gangster life. We gotta let some adjustment out. There we go. Do it for us, so we can snug everything up. There we go. I think we're gonna tighten this one up a little bit too. It's pretty loose. If I'm remembering right, when this car was actually on the road, it would squeal every time we started it up, and we never got around actually tightening the belt. So here we go. So now, basically everything is just reconnections. So we gotta run the wire harness back around, reconnect everything up. There's gonna be a couple things that aren't getting plugged in, like the crank angle sensor. That's not present on the 1.6s, so that's just gonna stay unplugged. All the coolant lines, I mean, it should be pretty self-explanatory. They kinda of all lay back to where they wanna go. So yeah, let's start plugging those in. So start here with this coolant hose. I think this normally has a spring clip on it, but at some point somebody replaced it with a normal hose clamp. Alright, while we're here we can do our heater hose connections. I squeezed the tubes a little bit when we were removing, so we're going to squeeze them back into a circle. Try not to make it worse. We also have this ground strap that we got to put back onto the body. You can see we got to take this one off. That was for the one six. Just the ten millimeter bolt. Okay, now we'll bring this engine harness over and around. So we just gotta fold this harness back around, start plugging everything in, get our TPS. Steering pressure sensor. I believe this is going to be our fan 
coolant temp. And we've got this, which is, I don't know, idle air, maybe. We do have a coolant connection back here that we may need to plug off. I don't remember what goes to it. Now for another annoying part. Um, we gotta fish the main harness, the main power harness around. So we gotta shove it back down into there, past the bell housing. We gotta connect it back up to the starter and the alternator, which I can't really show because you can't really see it. You just have to kind of feel it. Uh, so yeah, I'm gonna connect those and then we can continue on. So the power connection on the alternator seems to be different between the 1.6 and the 1.8. The 1.6 has a fairly small eyelet or ring connector, or whatever you want to call it here. The 1.8 has one that's way thicker. So I think we need to swap this little extension thing off the old alternator onto the new one. Or I think the alternator's well, the alternators don't interchange because the 1.6 uses the V-belt, the 1.8 uses the serpentine. So we should be able to kind of work this thing off, maybe. Definitely voids your alternator warranty. Okay, maybe you can't. Oh, no, there we go. It's got a little knurled portion that grabs onto it. So now, we can go pull the other one off the other alternator and we should be good you do want to be careful on this because you could easily break this thing out because it's only held into there by the windings all right so we got to pull the alternator to get to that i just noticed somebody whoever put the engine together forgot the bolt the lower bolt on the alternator where i guess it could have rattled out who knows but we gotta Loosen this upper bolt out. Okay, so here's a little bit of a better view. You can see how much bigger that stud is, so go ahead and loosen this up. So here's the difference between the two. So now, go ahead and put this in. Put our nut back on. Again, we don't have to go crazy, just snug. Good enough. And back in she goes. Also down here, we have our oil pressure sender, so we'll slide that in. You can use your imagination again. And that is about it down there. All right, now we can go ahead and put our booster connection on for the brake. Looks like I did the opposite thing when I pulled the engine. So we also got to run and plug in all these connections and I got to remember where these ground connections go. There's also a spade connector here. This is for the dash temp sensor. I think we're going to need to extend it actually since it's in a different location on this. But it's not critical yet. Got our coil plugged in. All right, we can also reconnect 
our sleeve cylinder. So we got a route or a two sensor wire around and see actually where it is. We may need to extend just because the O2 sensor is down a little lower. All right, we got to use this cam angle extension to reach over here since it's on the other side compared to the one six. And then we're gonna have to extend both the dash, water temp, sender, and the O2 sensor plug. All right, so we gotta cut and extend these. Start the water temp, cause it's a little easier to get to. I don't have the exact colors. The factory color is black with a blue stripe, which I do not have, so we're just gonna use black. I like to make connections using solder. You can crimp, but just what I do. Little heat shrink. Looks like we can just leave it at this length. sensor. Again, I don't have the exact color. This is red and blue. Red with a blue stripe. We're just going to use red. Okay. We need to tie those up a little bit better, but we've got our O2 sensor and temp sender for the dash hooked back up. Alright, so we need to make our coolant connections to the throttle body. Ordinarily, you still have the oil cooler, so this outlet right here that we have capped for now goes to the oil cooler, and that exit on the oil cooler goes to the back of the head. We have it capped off because we're not the oil cooler right now. We're gonna need to add the oil cooler back and have the lines from this outlet on the throttle body go back to the back side of the head, or at least run a water line from here to the back of the head, but for now, just hook this up, and we're not gonna get any real coolant flow because there's only an inlet and no exit. All right, now we can plumb our fuel lines back up. This lower one is the feed. See, the gas is already petrified. The covers we put on. There we go. And this line in the manifold is the feed line. Also hook up our throttle cable. All right, so the bracket from flying me out is not exactly the same as the OEM. You can't just slide it in like we took it off or like you can put it on with the OEM bracket because the opening here is too thin. So what you have to do is kind of just take everything apart. Take the sleeve out of the center of the rubber so it'll fit through there. Then slide the sleeve back in. Then you put the nut and the washer back on. Alright, so in the stock position, the bracket doesn't let the throttle body return all the way. So we need to loosen these nuts and we'll tighten this just so that there's a little bit of tension. It's not opening the blades yet. That should do it. We need a little bit more. 
Now I'm gonna go. I'm gonna go press the pedal, and hopefully we get full wide open. Cool. All right. So then we'll just snug these nuts up. That should be good. Now we'll deal with all of our vacuum sources. The 1.6 is pretty simple. It just has the vacuum for the brake booster up here that we already connected, and then the vacuum for the purge solenoid. So this is the vacuum source for that solenoid. We just need to run it under the throttle body, up and around, and hopefully we have enough slack to plug into the manifold. Uh, it's a little tight. Probably need to put a new well, we can actually, I don't think this port is used, so we just go to it. And if I'm remembering right, that's all the vacuum sources, so we'll need to cap that one, and then we should be good. That just about does it for all of our electrical, water, and vacuum connections. Now we can get our radiator back in, we can deal with the upper rad hose that we gotta cut, and also deal with the intake crossover tube that goes from the air box to the throttle body. All right, the rad should go in nice and easy. We have these little tabs here. That should slot in. These hold, hold downs here. Sure all of our electrical connections are up and out of our way. There we go. This is our overflow tube. Put that in. All right. So on these earlier NAs, the mount. Here. I believe on the NBs, they're up here, and maybe the later NAs. And these are just 12 millimeter. Now we gotta plug in our fan connections. Which, if you don't have AC, you only have one of these fans. All right, so now for our upper rad hose. Since the NA6s have the fan switch right here in the thermostat housing, we're gonna have to cut the upper rad hose, which we actually need to change to the 1.8 hose anyways. Or Finagle that in, but we need to cut it and we need to put our sensor in here so that we can plug in. All right, so here's our 1 8 hose. Um, we're gonna just test fit it on here for now. Then we're also gonna need to use, like I was mentioning, the 1 8 crossover for the intake because the 1 6 has a big resonance cavity right here that will interfere. So since we have the thickness of this, the crossover is kind of interfering with the fan, but once we push it on, it should clear everything. What we're looking for right now is we're trying to see where we can put our splice, and it looks like anywhere right here is gonna work okay. You can see it kicks up a little bit back in there, so we'll try to aim for right here. I'm just gonna put a line here so I know about how it lines up. I'll take our hose splice. Should have cut a little farther this way. You see we're not gonna quite get full engagement there. Uh, we are gonna probably need to take that thickness out. The thickness of this. But let's just test fit for now. May actually just be able to cut the hose here. Let's 
test fit our intake again. That should do okay. So we're gonna recut about here. All right, so here's our fan switch on the 1.6. We're gonna pop it off. Looks like someone gooped it up with RTV or something. Or maybe that's an ancient O-ring. Yeah, I think that's an O-ring that got way over tightened. So our kit came with a little O-ring. Go ahead and put that on the sensor. Thread it into our splice. Given that it is an O-ring, it doesn't need a ton of torque. That should do it. And we're probably gonna need to rotate it. Something like that. Looks like we should just reach. One thing we do have to do is we have to ground this splice since it's a one wire sensor. It already, it assumes that the sensor is grounded, which if it's screwed into the thermostat housing, it already is, but since it's floating in rubber, it's not right now. So the kit came with a length of wire and a couple ring terminals, so we're gonna use those. So we're gonna strip off what we need. Good. And th these are heat shrink connectors, so definitely shrink those to keep water out. Looks like we're gonna need a washer. I'm also gonna go ahead and rough up the anodizing so that we get a little bit of a better electrical connection. Then I'm using tooth washer to help get a little bit better contact between the spade and the screw. We're actually probably gonna want to go like this. We gotta figure out where we can ground this to. Could come up here and go to the valve cover. I think that's gonna be the easiest option for us. Looks like the kit comes with two different spade connectors and I used the wrong one. Looks like we've got a little stud here. May end up just using that. All right, let me just clamp these guys up. than I'd want it, but it should be okay. Probably should have shifted this over a little bit more, but live and learn. All right, now we can put our intake crossover on. So we need to loosen up. Clamp. Should hopefully slip over. Yep. We need to take this old math off because we're reusing the one six airflow meter. So we can put this box back in. I think we need to fish it through. Take these out. Drop it. And this one's the 10 millimeter. Oh, 
breather hose, which needs replaced. All right, so we'll have to replace this at some point. It's good enough for now. And we do have this breather connection. All right, we may need to steal the hose from the 1.8. Mm. It's different still. That might be a good torque. Cut here might might do it for us. Not perfect, but it is making a seal at least. So I think we'll do it. Plug our airflow meter back in. All right, now we're gonna change the oil real quick out of this and then fill it up with coolant, bleed the clutch, and I think we're ready to fire it up. All right, now we'll go ahead and fill our cooling system up. Just use regular green stuff. All right, I think we're ready to hook the battery back up and see if she fires up. We need to get our shifter back in, and before we do that, we gotta fill the turret housing. So we're just gonna fill it with the same stuff that we filled the transmission with. It doesn't take a ton, but it does take more than that. You don't wanna go too full or else when you put the shifter in, it'll displace the oil and overflow. That should do it. Now is your chance to replace the turret housing boot. Ours is in good shape, luckily. You do have to line this notch with that stud thing sticking out. Okay, that should do it. So the outer shifter cover was torn, so we're gonna go ahead and replace it. All right, so it's kind of a stretch to get this over. It's got this plastic piece. I lubed it up with WD. Even then, it's a big stretch. You gotta be careful not to tear it. It's easy to do that. Pretty close. Now, put the center console back in. Alright, so I think we're good to fire her up. I'm gonna grab the timing light and have that ready. It's ballpark, so we'll just need to set it before we go on a drive. Uh, yeah, so let's turn the key and see what happens. Okay, well, obviously we're missing something. I believe the issue was with me. I think we swapped the feed and return lines. So we'll switch those real quick. Probably spray fuel everywhere. Yeah, that's not right. Try to let the pressure out in that kind of controlled manner. There we go. Who would have guessed that a fuel pressure regulator doesn't flow fuel the opposite way? Okay. Alright, 
now with Trister. Some self adjustment, maybe. I don't know. I, I messed with the plug wires a little bit. There might have been one that wasn't quite seated. But there we go. We seem to be running pretty good. Hopefully that clears up. So we'll let it idle a little bit. We'll let it warm up and then we can set our timing. Probably way off, so might be way retarded. All right, so to set our timing, we need the jumper, the ground, and the ten terminal. And look at this diagram. So we're gonna go ahead and use a little piece of wire. That should put the ECM into fixed timing mode. There we go. And also set our idle speed. And then we can set. The stock timing is 10 degrees before top dead center. I don't know if it's going to show up on camera. Is the shutter speed. You can kind of see it. Maybe. Oh yeah, you can see it. So we're going to set it to 14, which it's actually pretty close to. Stock timing is 10 degrees, but if you advance it a little bit, you just lose out on a little bit of emissions, which who cares? We're in Mexico anyway. And it's free power, so... We're gonna advance it to 14. Let's see, you got two. So each tick is tw is two, and it actually looks like we're already at 14, which is kind of crazy. So I just set it by hand, but we'll just snug it up. If you do have to change it, you just grab this, the cam angle sensor, and rotate it, and you'll see the timing mark dance around, and you stop where you want it. So we're already at where we need to be. With that connector still in there, we're going to set the idle to 850 RPM if we're not already there. Alright, so each tick on here is about 330 RPM. So we're idling at about 650 or so, which is a little low. So we're going to bring it up a little bit. That should help it come back to idle a little easier. So this cap covers the screw that we need to adjust. This is going to be a pain in the butt to get to. And it's really hot. Yeah, we got to pull the motor back out to set the timing. We need to pull the coils off. Okay, hopefully we sneak in now. so clean it's hard to tell. Ok, 
Okay, so I think we're ready to drop her off the stands and take her out for the road. All right, so here we go. Take her on the road. The clutch is way stiffer than what was on here before. I do feel like it might need a little bit more bleeding though, potentially. The one six would not do that. Definitely can already feel different, so that's good. I'm sure the torque around corners is gonna be significant compared to the 1.6. The 1.6 basically couldn't break the rear wheels loose around a corner. Yep, it breaks it. Breaks it loose. All right, so minor hiccup in the 1.8 swap. We took the 91 and the 99 out onto the Loman Loop, which is kind of just the best of the twisty roads around here. And unfortunately, the 91 started acting up. It started missing on cylinder number one. Honestly, it ran pretty good on just three cylinders. They could have made a three cylinder Miata and the, the three cylinder 1.8 feels kind of like the old 1.6. So unfortunately we lost compression and it turns out, if you guys remember back to when I was talking about how the previous owner forgot the crank angle sensor hold down bolt. So the timing was way advanced. You can see we chipped an exhaust valve. You can also see how the buildup is all different. So, we're gonna have to drop that off at the shop to get a new valve job, probably a new seat. So we'll slap that back in and then we're gonna take her to the track and see how it performs. All right, so about a thousand bucks later, we're back with the newly rebuilt cylinder head. You can see here's our burned exhaust valve. Turns out the guides were all loose on this thing, so that's why they didn't seal properly and burned. And there were two other exhaust valves that weren't far behind. You can see some of the, the pitting starting, especially on that one. So we're gonna go ahead and slap this back on, do a timing belt service just cause we're in there. If you wanna see the procedure, we've got that all on the 99NB engine rebuild series. So you can go check that out and yeah. All right, so we are back at the drag strip after getting the new motor in. It is a rainy, wet day, so they got the track closed down to an eighth mile for now, so that's all we're gonna be running. If I remember right, last time, quarter mile, we were running mid-low 18s, I think it was, so I would think maybe 17s is what the 1.8's gonna be in. Plus it's a fresh motor, maybe high 16s, but we're limited by driver skill right now, so. We'll see. 12 flat eighth mile, bogged it at the start and then pulled it all the way through. I didn't realize where the eighth mile was on this track. So next time, it should be better. Knocked the tenth off. All right, so that wasn't exactly a scientific test, but we had an equally bad driver both times. Um, the 1.8 was maybe about half second to one second faster on comparable runs. The biggest difference with the 1.8 coming from the 1.6 is the torque you get just putzing around town, especially around corners and stuff. It's a lot easier to break the tires loose. If you've got a cheap donor 1.8, I would highly recommend swapping it for the 1.6. It's pretty easy with the Flan Miata kit. Definitely happy with how this swap turned out, so see you guys in the next time.